It's October, it's officially spooky season, and I'm setting up my Samhain altar. And so today I wanted to talk about Samhain altars and the different ways that you can set one up within your own magical and spiritual practice. <music> So for those of you who don't know me, hi, hello, my name is Hearth, I'm a practicing witch and I love Samhain. Samhain, also known as Halloween, is a really big part of my magical practice. It's always been one of my favourite Sabbaths. Okay, no, I lie. It's always been my favourite Sabbath in the Wheel of the Year, which is a collection of eight celebrations that represent the changing of the seasons and the harvest times and all of the significant points in the year. Samhain is the third of the harvest festivals. It is the final harvest festival of the year, primarily known for its harvest of pumpkins and corn, which is one of the reasons why pumpkins are so prevalent around this time of year. Now for me, as you might have noticed, I love the spooky season as well as Samhain. So for me, I love Halloween. I love everything spooky ooky, but I also love Samhain. I think it is one of the most beautiful festivals. It is all about honoring our ancestors, honoring the dead, being one with the spirits around us and the spiritual realm, connecting more with spirits and potentially for some having even more spiritual encounters than usual. It's about honouring the harvest, representing all of the good that we've experienced for the rest of the year and getting ready for a cold, probably very dark winter. It's the last hurrah before winter kind of really sets in. And for me, it plays a really pivotal part in my year. It's one of my favourite times of year. And so I really get into the Samhain spirit. So this year, you're probably going to be seeing quite a lot of Samhain content from me, whether it is on YouTube, whether it is on Instagram. I just love this time of year. And one of the big things that I will do for Samhain and all of the other Sabbaths is set up a Samhain altar. Now my altar is the top of an apothecary cabinet and because I live in a space where I can't easily see the changing of the seasons from outside of my windows, I use it as a really good way of keeping track of the energy of any given time of year. Every Sabbath, a new picture comes onto the altar, the altar decorations change out, there's different candles and incense and representations, and I find it to be almost a meditative practice. Now, obviously, I'm filming it for the purposes of showing everyone here, but even when I do it and I don't film it, I find it to be a really meditative time. And if you've never made a Samhain altar before, it could be an ideal time to start because for many, Samhain is considered the new year. Now, Samhain altars can look like many different things depending on what it is that you want to represent. They can represent the seasonal energy, so you can focus on the changing of the seasons. You can focus on the fact that it is a harvest festival. You can focus on it being the last hurrah before the starts of winter. And you can also focus on it from the perspective of spirit work, whether that be working with spirits of the dead, spirits of the other world, or ancestors, depending on what it is that you connect with. And so altars around Samhain can be highly variable and very unique. If you aren't part of any set tradition that sets up altars in a particular way, you can make your altar your own. You can have it look however you want. If you want your Samhain altar to be bright neon pink, then you can do that as long as your spirits, ancestors, or whoever else you're working with, if you're working with anyone because you don't need to, appreciate that as well. Altars can be highly adaptable, which is why I'm going to ask you at the very start of this video to let me know what your Samhain altar is going to look like this year. I would love to know the different things that you are going to put on it. So we're going to start with my Samhain altar, simply because this is what I'm working with, and it could be a good starting point if you do want some inspiration for your own. My altar is a representation of many different aspects of Samhain. For me, it is a collection of all things Samhain related in one space. And I'll also likely change things out as the Sabbath goes on, as I'm focusing on different aspects of the season. I set my Samhain altar up on the 10th of October, so I'm quite early in the season because Samhain falls on Halloween the 31st of October. It allows me a lot of time to change and shift that altar. So to start with, I cleanse my altar space. I have a little handheld besom for this, but you can use whatever feels appropriate to you. For me, the besom offers a way of both cleansing and cleaning that altar space in one go because it can get quite dusty. If you need to, you can use a cloth to wipe everything down and then use a little bit of rosemary to burn and smoke that space to cleanse that energy away. If you don't feel like the energy needs cleansing, you don't need to do that either. 
I'm going in with a particular spray. Now this is an addition, it's not something that you have to do, but because this is Samhain, I really like opening up a little bit of a divide between the spirit world and the mundane human world. I really enjoy having those interactions around this time of year. Working with spirits is something that I do as a regular practice for me, so it isn't something I'm particularly concerned of. You might not want to do this though if you don't feel comfortable with it. This is actually a spray from Sons of Asgard, not affiliated with them, I just really enjoy using their products. And this is a spray that I will commonly use when I'm opening up my spaces for spirit work, especially around Samhain, it also helps that it smells amazing. So I spritz this around the space and I will also use this spray for any workings that I'm gonna be doing where spirits are involved. Once that's done, I start adding things onto that altar space. The first thing that usually goes up is my piece of art. Now the art varies, Sabbath to Sabbath, I tend to just doodle and create things in Procreate, but this one in particular was my merch design, my first ever merch design, so let me know if you have any of your merch from that first drop. I still have all of mine, I wear all of the jumpers, like the sweaters, with this print on it to bed, I wear the t-shirts to bed all of the time. I still love this design and so I made it coloured and I'm using that as the central focus because cauldrons are quite a big significant significant factor at Samhain. Not only are they highly associated with Halloween and that stereotypical view of witches, but they are also associated with transformation. And for me, Samhain is a massive time of transformation. It is a time where very obviously around me, the leaves are changing, the season is shifting, the energy is altering, the temperature is dropping. It's very much a transformative time. And so the cauldron is a great representation for that. That transformation can often be for the positive, it's for the better, it's taking energy and transforming it into something different. So for me that symbolism is really significant. Often around Samhain I would include a cauldron on this altar and there is a tiny tiny one that you'll see later but for the most part this time I'm focusing on the pumpkins. What is going on this altar, however, is quite a bit of art in the form of different oracle cards. Now within my divination, I primarily work with tarot. If I need answers, I have two or three decks that I will go to regularly. My primary deck is the Rider Waite Smith deck. I will use this mostly for my own readings. If I'm reading for someone else, I will either use the Forest of Enchantment tarot or I will use the Wild Unknown mini. Those are the ones I typically go to. But in my collection, I do have a lot of oracle cards. Now, I have a video on the differences between the two. If you are confused, I will leave it linked up here. But essentially, tarot cards are often more detailed. There's usually more cards in a deck, and the majority of tarot cards are based on the same or a similar system, whereas all oracle cards are unique unto themselves. That means the artwork on them is often very different from one deck to another, and they can be really useful as focal points for meditation, for divination, for altar spaces, for spells and rituals. They can even just be used as beautiful artwork, especially decks that do surround deities and different gods and goddesses that you might want to work with. For me, on this particular altar, I'm going to be working with two decks. We're working with the Living Altar Oracle deck, and we're also going to be working with the Sons of Asgard Sabbat deck, which is the one that I use the most on my altar spaces now. So one is a Samhain card, the other is an Ancestor card, because Samhain is really focused on connecting with our ancestors. A lot of the times it will surround leaving offerings for ancestors or creating an ancestor altar, which is what we're going to be talking about in just a moment. On here, I'm also going to be placing a lot of representations for Samhain. For me, this is largely pumpkins. There's a lot of pumpkin patches around me that I do go and visit. I do have a vlog coming out all about my Samhain practices and the things that I want to do for Samhain. And going to a pumpkin patch is one of them. I was very excited about it. I've already done it. It was amazing. So for me, pumpkins are a really big thing at this time of year. And so there's going to be lots of pumpkins on the altar. There's lots of these mini plastic pumpkins. And then I have some bigger pumpkins going on as well. Now there are going to be a couple of additional items on here, so I have this little tiny brass and copper cauldron. This I have no idea where it came from, it's one of those magical items that just kind of popped into my collection one day and has never left. And then I'm also going to be adding on a small skull. Now this is a crystal human skull and these are really significant around Samhain and are incredibly useful if you want to be adding in the ancestor work aspect of the Samhain season. 
Finally, I am adding on my two larger pumpkins. I have my cat pumpkin that I carved from the pumpkin I got from the pumpkin patch. I also have a vintage pumpkin that my parents have had for longer than I have been alive, I think. It has been around for as long as I can remember. I'm pretty certain it came from Hobbycraft at some point in time. And that is my Samhain altar all set up. Now, some of you might be thinking, Hearth, you're missing something and you're right, I am. I do have a little Bridget doll sitting on the altar. She lives on the altar at all times, no matter what the Sabbath. So she is not Samhain specific. She is just a figure that I work with on a regular basis. So as we can see, my Sabbath altar contains a lot of different aspects of the Samhain energy and the Samhain season. And I leave the central part of the altar with the tree on it, free for any kind of spells and rituals that I want to be carrying out during the Sabbath season. Now this is not the only style of Samhain altar that you can make. There are lots of options out there that can vary from very, very big to very, very small. While we're enjoying the spooky season Samhain celebrations, I wanted to pop in here to thank today's video sponsor, Aura. Now I've used Aura for several years now and I really enjoy what they have to offer. It is a mindfulness and meditation app, essentially a one-stop shop for all things that you can think of or hope for within these categories and they've won the best of Apple award and I completely get why. Personally my favourite sections of the app are the sleep sounds. I find them really useful for having deeper and more meaningful sleep which then massively helps my magical practice and my ability to focus the following day. Especially the thunderstorms, I'm a sucker for some heavy rain and thunderstorms. But they also have sleep stories not only to help you fall asleep faster but perhaps even to also improve your visualisation skills. They have guided meditations and one of my favourite areas are actually the courses, especially their meditation courses as well as visualisation courses, they are really useful. There are also sections for CBT as well as life coaches and it's just such a varied app. At this time of year, my favourite sections are actually the Ancestor Guided Meditations. It's really the perfect thing for the Samhain season. If this all sounds interesting to you, Aura is offering the first 500 people to click the link in the description box, a free trial and 25% off their membership. So thank you so much to Aura for supporting my channel and thank you so much to anyone who listens to the sponsors and supports them. It really massively helps me and yeah, thank you so much. One of the other popular forms of altar for this time of year is actually an ancestor altar. Now I have done a whole video on this subject, if you do want to go more in depth on this I will leave it linked up here as with everything else, I'll also put it down in the description box. But an ancestor altar is a space where you are able to honour, venerate and in some cases work with your ancestors. It is commonly set up during Samhain, though many people all around the world will have ancestors set up all of the time. And how you choose to work with your ancestor altar is going to be based on your tradition, your culture, your background, and how often you will regularly work with your ancestors. Especially at this time of year, where many people consider it easier to connect with the spiritual world, this is often referred to as the veil being thin. I think it's important to bear in mind though that spirit communication and spirit crossover can happen at all times of year. It's just that many people find it easier during this time, so Samhain, the end of October, as well as Beltane, the very start of May. And if you are in the Southern Hemisphere, those are going to be reversed. They find it easier to communicate with fair folk, with spirits of those who've passed over, of ancestors. They might find it easier to commune with them. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can't at any other time of the year. There are, however, many stories of lost loved ones coming to the homes of their family members during Samhain and experiencing what is known as a dumb supper, where a plate is left out for them at a family feast and they are allowed to join in with that celebration among the rest of their living family members as well as stories of lanterns and candles being left out in windows to offer guidance to lost spirits who want to find their way back. There are so many different stories surrounding the Samhain season that it's easy to see why people connect it so closely with ancestors and ancestor work. Now, when it comes to working with ancestors on an ancestor altar, you have two different ways that you can take this. You can work with what are known as the known dead. These are people that you knew personally, or you know them by name and by face. So perhaps you never met your great, great uncle Gary, but you have pictures of him and you've had stories of him passed down to you. You know his name and you know his face and maybe you have objects that belonged to him. Or you would know your grandmother, for instance. You knew her personally. You have your own personal experiences with her. You have photographs with her. You have some of her belongings. These kind of people would be considered the known dead. 
you then also have an alternative option, which are the unknown dead. These are the people that you know must have existed because you exist, but you might not know them by face and you don't know them by name. You have no personal experiences with them and perhaps no one that you've ever known in your lifetime has ever known them either. These are the unknown dead, the people that you know exist but didn't know them personally and these are going to require two slightly different routes. I do think it's important to note though that when we are referring to ancestors, it does not just mean blood ancestors. It is the people in our lives who have shaped us as individuals. Yes, that includes blood, but it also includes the people who have had a significant impact on our lives and have worked with us in positive and beneficial ways. So for instance, it could be your found family. It could be a friend who has really shaped your life for 10 plus years, who sadly passed on way too young. They may well be considered an ancestor, just as your great aunt Norma might be considered an ancestor. This also applies if you are adopted as well, or perhaps you don't know who your family is at all. This could also include, for instance, an adoptive family. They shaped who you are. They are one of the reasons you are where you are today. They are your ancestors, just as much as your blood relatives may be your ancestors. And in some cases, people may not choose to work with their blood ancestors at all for many different reasons. They may instead solely choose to work with ancestors in the form of foster family or found family. It's also good here to note that in some cases and in some regions around the world, your direct family members, so your known ancestors, might not want to come through on an ancestor altar because their faith was directly opposed to what it is that you are doing. That doesn't necessarily mean that you can't work with your ancestors, you're probably just gonna have to go further back in time, perhaps looking at your unknown dead rather than your known relatives, especially if they were quite intense Christians. Let's put it that way, not everyone is gonna feel comfortable contacting their uncle Craig if you know that he would have been really unhappy with what you choose to do in your own personal life, which is entirely up to you. So with that all being said, let's choose what we're going to be doing. So if we're working with the known dead, on that altar, you might want representations of them. So it could be a photograph of your grandmother, a photograph of your great uncle. If you don't have photographs, perhaps you have something that belonged to them, a brooch that they wore, or a pocket watch, something that represents them directly because it's something that they owned. If you have a letter that was written, perhaps a birthday card that was written to you in their handwriting, this is something that can be used and you can take this further afield. Some people may have bits of clothing or perhaps lockets with hair in them because that was a very traditional thing once upon a time, especially a couple of hundred years ago. You might have a letter that was addressed to someone else in their handwriting that you can then place on the altar as a representation of them. Now this is a space where you can spend time and you can reminisce and you can feel their presence. So you're not going to want anything on that altar that's going to make you feel really bad about a situation. It's more having items on that altar that almost bring them into that space. They are a representation of them. If you don't know your ancestors, so you are working with the unknown dead, you're going to need to take this in a slightly different route and find common connections. And this is why the skull that I had on my altar earlier gets kind of significant. Skulls are one thing that connects all humans. We all have one. They might not all look the same, but we all have one. And so that skull is a representation of our interconnected link between ourselves and the people who came before us. It is one thing that represents humans time. And we see skulls being used as communication in many different forms. So for instance, we can think to skull communication happening quite a lot with the idea that a skull is able to be the vessel for communication from the afterlife. And that's something that we will touch on later on in this video. So the skull is a really recognizable symbol for humanity. And so because of that, we can place a skull on the altar as a representation for ancestors whose names and faces we don't know. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. I have a couple of crystal skulls within my own collection, but you can use plastic skulls, you can use glass skulls. Halloween stores at this time of year have a lot of skulls that you can use. I actually have a copper one that I got from TK Maxx years and years ago that I will use for this. You can get skull candles that will work for this. We actually sell them in our store. They vary from being really, really small to quite substantial and large that can be used for communing with ancestors. Lots of different options out there depending on 
what you have access to. You can also choose a skull in a particular color based on what it is that you would like it to represent. So for instance, if you just want a generic skull to represent all of your ancestors, you can just use a white or ivory colored skull. If you would like to offer some protection to that space, you can get a skull in black. If you want communication with your ancestors, you might want to get a skull that is blue. There's so many different options out there, so use your color correspondence accordingly, or just have a skull for the sake of having a skull. They're also really useful to blend into the background because if you live in the Northern Hemisphere, Samhain lines up with Halloween. And so it's really easy if someone comes into your home and they go, oh my God, what's that? And you can go, it's a Halloween skull, <laughs> obviously. Now on this altar, you might also want to have items that represent the regionality of your ancestors. So for instance, if you are an American and you know that your ancestors do not come from America, instead maybe they come from Italy or maybe they come from Ireland or maybe they come from Spain, you might want to add items onto that altar that represent something that they recognize. Perhaps this is a picture of the landscape that they may well have existed within. Perhaps this is a particular object that represents the region where they came from. If you've done any kind of ancestry, 23andMe, anything like that, that's gonna give you pinpointed information on where your ancestors came from, this can be incredibly useful, especially when we're gonna go ahead and talk about offerings. Now, all of your altars don't have to be big, massive spaces. Like mine is quite substantial. Mine is the top of a cabinet, but you can have a simple shelf. You can have a section of your altar be for your ancestors. As long as the other spirits and deities, if you choose to work with any that you're currently working with on that space, accept that being an addition to it, you can include it onto a larger pre-existing altar. You can have a little shoebox. You can have a piece of art be your altar that is just a flat coloring that you've created. You can have your screensaver on your laptop be your altar. There's so many different options. They don't have to be large, expansive spaces. What they should be are places where you can do your workings. You can honor the season, honor the spirits, honor your ancestors. You can give offerings if that's what you choose to do. And so offerings is kind of a really big part of this time of year. If you're working with your ancestors, you might want to choose to give offerings, but not just with ancestors, but also with the fair folk, with spirits and deities that you might choose to be working with. As mentioned earlier, Samhain is a really common time to be having a dumb supper where you leave an extra place setting and an extra portion for your ancestors that cannot be physically present at that gathering. You can also leave offerings out on your altar spaces. So a common one is to leave a fresh glass of water, but really it's gonna be down to what your ancestors would like. So for instance, if I were to leave an offering on my ancestor altar today, it would probably be a cup of tea <laughs> because the majority of people in my family really love drinking tea. I think I'm the only one out. Like I'm trying, I have a cup of tea right here, right? I don't get it. <laughs> I. I don't understand, this will probably go cold, I will forget about it, and then before you know it, it ends up down the sink. Because I don't understand tea, but my ancestors, the people that I've known within my own life, the known dead, loved tea. Another very common offering is alcohol, alcohol that they would really resonate with. And obviously what you choose is going to depend on what you have around. If you have pets and children, maybe it's best not to leave alcohol lying around. And it also is gonna depend on the time period within which you are working. So for instance, the ancestors that I would really want to work with are probably going to want half a pint of shandy. <laughs> That was the classic order that was always given. Can I have half a pint of shandy? Yes, you can, Grandma, that's fine. Whereas for other people, it might be vodka and lemonade. It might be brandy. It might be whiskey. It might be a small glass of wine. It might be a specific regional alcohol that you know your ancestors would have really liked if you don't know them personally. So for instance, if you know that your ancestors came from Italy, then you might want to be looking at some regional alcohols, perhaps even some regional cocktails or mixes that may well be more to your ancestors' tastes and interests. You might want to be looking at food to give as an offering. It doesn't have to be an entire plate of food. It can just be a small bit that is set aside for your ancestors that they can then consume and then you can compost or recycle the remains of that that are left behind. You can also give incense as an offering. This is a really common one or simply spend time with them especially if you want to connect with them on a deeper level, spending time 
playing their favourite music for instance, or talking to them about your memories and your experiences with them, talk about your life, ask them about theirs. You might want to do this every day, every couple of days, every week, just spend a little bit of time with them, just communing with them. You can then take this further if you want to, so you can do workings with your ancestors, you can ask them for information to come through to you in dreams or meditations, you can do divination with them, you can even request their aid during spells and rituals if you've built up enough of a rapport with them. And in some cases, if they are coming through to you and giving you information in dreams and through meditations, you might find that your unknown dead can quite quickly become your known dead because they start giving you information about themselves that you can then take, you can reference and you can figure out who your ancestors are, kind of the backwards way round, where instead of knowing who they are first, you're knowing about it afterwards. Many people within the community will keep ancestor altars all of the time, just like they would keep deity altars or altars for their spirit guides or guardians or in some cases angels. They will keep an altar out all of the time and give regular offerings. What I will say is if you are going to make offerings to really any spirit, including ancestors, spirits that you don't know personally, the fair folk, deities, I would recommend giving yourself a routine or letting them know in advance that this is a short-term practice. Especially when we're talking about the fair folk, while it is common to give offerings at this time of year, as well as other times of year, such as Beltane and Letha, it's really important that we don't set a standard that we cannot maintain. Our ancestors are often a little bit more lenient than other spirits may be. And so with ancestors, you can perhaps get away with a little bit more, but with certain fair folk, you do not want to mess with them. If you say you're going to give them an offering every single day, make sure that you do it. If you are only planning on doing this for a set amount of time, then pre-plan how long that's going to go on for and let them know in advance. It isn't necessarily to say that giving offerings is a bad thing or dangerous. It's simply to say that communication is really important, both with the living and with those that are in the spiritual realms, whether that be the other world or the afterlife, wherever it may be, communication is important. If you know that you are realistically not going to be able to give an offering on your ancestor altar every day, a week is more manageable, let them know that that's what you're going to do and stick to it. If you know that you're only giving an individual gift to the fair folk, you're giving them a singular offering, let them know that you are giving it to them because you appreciate their presence in your space, but this is the offering that you are going to give and it's not going to be a consistent thing. Let them know in advance. Over communication is always way better than under communication. It's much better for them to be over prepared than have them be guessing because if they're guessing, they're probably going to be getting annoyed with you. And that's not really what you want. Now, of course, altars don't have to be set spaces. Sometimes your entire home can be an altar so you can decorate in the colors. I know that I'm decorating for this Sabbath season. It can also be the things that you are wearing and you can also have an internal or inner altar. These would reside within your inner temple, the space that you can retreat into and do your spells and rituals inside. Now, I have my own little space. I learned how to do this from the book Witchcraft Theory and Practice by D'Angelis. I have yet to reread that book, though I've not read it in 15 years, so it might not be great, but that's where I first learned how to do this practice. And it's a way of taking our practice inwards if you aren't able to openly express your own spiritual beliefs and your wish. Witchcraft. So that's another option as well. That's a very aggressive sounding car. Art thou coming or going? Or just sitting outside revving your engine? Going. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Ultimately, when it comes to Samhain altars, the important thing is that you like it and that it's functional for you. If you know that you don't feel comfortable working with spirits, then you don't need to be setting up any kind of ancestor or spirit-based altar. You just don't need to. The most important thing is that you feel comfortable and happy with what you're doing. If you only want to focus on one aspect of the season, you just want an altar that has harvest items on it that's very orange and vivid and very vibrant and colorful and light and bright and maybe it's got fairy lights on it, then you are fine doing that and your altar is just as valid as someone who does really intense spirit work. 
you don't need to be carrying out necromancy or spirit communication if you don't want to. And so it's just important that your Samhain altar fits what you need. Don't let anyone else tell you that your Samhain altar isn't samhain enough. If it's samhain enough for you, that's all that matters. Now, of course, I am going to briefly touch on it for anyone who does want to go down the necromancy spirit communication kind of route. There's a lot of options going on here that you can incorporate into your altar. The first being a skull. These can become talking skulls. Essentially, when you've communed with your ancestors enough, whether they are ancestors or whether they are spirits that you are working with, you may wish to evoke them into a space or into an object. Commonly, that would be within a circle that you would evoke them, but you can also evoke them into a skull or an object. And this is a temporary space where they can commune through that to you. So this could be, for instance, a crystal ball or a scrying ball. This could be an obsidian scrying mirror. This could be something like a crystal skull because you can scry in crystal skulls. It's very interesting to do, especially if you can get quite a nicely sized glass or quartz, like clear quartz skull. Though do bear in mind the quartz skulls are a lot more expensive. You can do ancestor communication and spirit communication through that. I will say though, it's quite important to make sure you have your protections up and to be quite secure in your own magical practice practice. That's not to scare anyone. It's simply to say that sometimes things can come through that you don't want to come through. And it's really important that if you are able to evoke something into that space, you are also able to banish it and remove it as well. And ultimately the key here is to keep yourself safe. If you don't want to be evoking or summoning any kind of spirit, you don't have to. You can simply take part in divination. This can be, once again, with crystal skulls, could be with crystal balls, it could be with scrying mirrors. I have multiple videos on that subject. Or you can simply sit down and do some tea leaf reading and have it be done at your altar if that's what you want to do as well. Sometimes communication with ancestors doesn't have to include spirit summoning. It can simply be sitting down with a cup of tea with your ancestors, pour them a mug too, have a conversation with them, be asking a few questions, sipping your tea, with the dregs of the tea bag or the tea leaves in the bottom and then do a tea leaf reading at the end of it to get some answers from that communication. It doesn't have to be super intense but whatever it is that you are doing if you are working with spirits make sure that you are keeping yourself safe. It is far better to be over prepared for a situation than under prepared and ultimately have a good time with it. If you don't want to do any kind of Saba altar, you don't need to. If you don't want to be doing spirit work, you don't need to either. I would love to know though, as mentioned, what you are including on your Samhain altar. What is it that you are in particular focusing on? Or are you just decking a space out with Halloween decorations? I would absolutely love to know. And feel free to share any to me on Instagram and I will try to share them on my stories as inspiration for anyone who wants some ideas for their own Samhain altar. So with that being said, I have so many more videos on Samhain coming out. We're doing a video on soul cakes. It's going to be a Samhain vlog. I have things happening and I'm breaking them down into smaller videos because I know that I can talk for England. I talk a lot and sometimes long videos are just a little bit too much for people. So those videos are going to be coming out in the coming weeks. If you did like this, please give it a like. It means a lot to me. If you do have any questions or comments, feel free to put them down in the comment section. And if you do enjoy the magical content on this channel or in this video, feel free to hit subscribe. I feel free to hit subscribe. I try to post magical content every single week. So with that being said, I hope you're staying safe. I hope you have a marvelous magical day and I will see you in the next video. Okay, have an amazing salmon season and I will see you soon. Bye.